started and we'll uh, start recording. So, welcome everybody. Um, hopefully you guys have all done module one so far. Um, we're ready for module two. So, this Zoom meeting tonight, we're going to kind of just brief over chapters five through eight. Um, if you guys have any specific questions, don't hesitate to, to ask them. Uh, you can always type them in the group chat and we'll get to them when we can um, near the end if I don't get to them. I'm also going to cover some of the, uh, there's been a lot of responses or requests from people about uh, Zoom meeting information. Um, a lot of people are like logging into Zoom daily and they're not actually daily. So we're going to cover all of that. Uh, what we'll start with is the, uh, how does everybody feel about how module one went? Like, did it go well? I think I can see hands if you guys have hands. Sad faces, angry faces. Um, was it easy to find? Um, a couple people are having some issues with it and I think I got that resolved. Uh, um, your chapter tests, I actually made it so you guys can do more than one. So you can do more than one time so you can get a better score if you want a second time. 70% uh, is passing, so you don't have to, to strive for that 90 or 100%. Um, it's preferred to be uh, higher than that, but it is a 70% passing grade. So as long as you, you're passing, um, we would prefer it was higher. We want you to be 90% or medics, not 70% medics. Uh, but I did allow that, I uh, did open up that so you can do it more than once. There's also a study plan and the study plan will allow you to go in a few times and redo questions if you feel like you need more. A lot, a lot of people I find do better at retaining information when they're quizzed on it as opposed to just reading books or reading chapters. And that's kind of how my learning is, is I have to see it on like YouTube or see it done in front of me or take a bunch of quizzes and the quizzes, when I, when I know I'm wrong at something, I'll learn it better than if I just multiple guess and I guess it right. I actually do better if I get, a, if I get it wrong the first time and then I can look it up. Uh, so I have opened that up for people. Uh, it's still kind of a work in progress. We're still learning how to use the My, My Lab Brady. Um, if you can't see that, you can't tell. I have a I have a question on that real quick um, yeah. with the chapter tests. Um, I saw that it opened up and we could do a couple of tries. Um, so when I even if I didn't need to, like if I got a high 90 something, it'll still say that um, it's still something that's um, outstanding and over. Is that an issue? It does. <laughs> OK, let me see. Let me see. Let me. Uh, I'll say it's past due. Really? It shouldn't. You would think that. All right, that's some of the it, stuff we're it, having to to learn on here. So this is attempt. So like I did attempt one out of two. So I I got one and I got like a ninety six percent on it. So I'm like great. And and but it still says it's past due because the quiz was a couple of days ago and this I haven't done the second attempt yet. So I was just curious. And that's not something you necessarily need to fix tonight. As long as it allows you to pass it, like it doesn't force you to take it, that would be preferred. Like, I don't think it's, I think, I don't think it's going to make you take it twice. So I see, was that chapter seven? Well, you had opened up the, yeah, so I needed to redo, I believe it was seven and 10 or seven and nine. There were a couple of them I was asking you on a couple, a few days ago. And so you opened it up to allow us to be able to take um, take it several times, but mm -hmm. I don't necessarily have to take all of them over again. No, so I just opened it up because I think a lot of people learn better that way. Um, yeah, it's doing the same thing to mine where it's saying it's past due, but I've already done it. Is it allowing you to move forward to the next? Yes, it just it just in your calendar thing, like uh, assignments and then like assignments due it shows as it being past due. It's, yeah, that's, that's what doing. it's not registering as being completed. When I click in the grade book, 
uh, for like Haley, especially uh, chapter seven, I only see it as your final score. And it doesn't say past you or anything like that. So I don't know okay. if I, you guys worry about it or not. No, that's fine. I just wanted to make sure that it was being counted and it wasn't something that um, it was expecting me to do more than one before I could complete, be considered complete. Yeah. Yeah, all I'm seeing is there is your final one. So that's good. Yeah. Um, it looks like you guys can, can skip over it. So you don't have to do it twice. Cause that would be annoying to do that. <laughs> There's 40 chapters. I would not want you to do it 80 times. <laughs> so, um, all right. So that's, that's good to know. So we can let, so the next, a lot of this that we're doing these notes and stuff is for the next go around of, of class, the next students. So we will let the next instructor know that if you do open it up to multiple attempts, that uh, it's going to continue to tell the students that they're going to be past due. So that's good to know. Uh, any other issues taking um, tests or assignments? Um, one of the things that was brought up was, uh, chapter four homework there is no chapter four homework because you guys have three med legal discuss discussion boards and then one patty assignment so that was your guys's chapter four homework so when people were looking for something actually titled chapter four homework it doesn't exist because it's separate into the four different discussion boards does that make sense Okay, so don't go looking for it. There was somebody that was um, that was frantically looking for it, and it's it's gone. Doesn't exist. So, um, it has been uh, not assigned to you guys. Um, so we'll move right into the next module chapters, um, chapters five through through eight. I'm going to basically just cover the stuff that you guys are going to really need to focus on in the future modules. A lot of five through eight is gonna be knowing anatomical terms. It's best to, to learn them early. You're also going to know, need to know your anatomy and physiology. And they're all gonna play into their role as we get into more medical sections. Um, so like when you get into your trauma, you better know like which bones are what. Um, like which one's gonna be your radius, which one's gonna be your ulna. I always remember that I check a radial pulse near my thumb because my thumb turns in a radius. So the radial bone, radius, radial um, pulse on the thumb side. And then your ulna is gonna be on your pinky side. So little things like that is gonna help you remember which bones are which. Um, even though if, if I see somebody with a broken wrist, I don't know which one's broken. Probably both of them might only be one, but it's good to know which bone is located where and why uh, it's called the radial pulse. Um, knowing your humerus, knowing the, the large bones. You don't have to know every single little metatarsal, metacarpal um, in your hands and feet, but it's good to know what they're basically called. Uh, it also is a good point of reference when you need to do your charting and you have to have something that is uh, posterior or anterior if the patient is supine. So those kind of definitions are really good to know for documenting as well as um, like you're talking to the people you're going to drop the patient off with. So being able to say that it was lateral, it was towards the midline. So that's basically how these chapters kind of start. Um, I have a little, I have some tricks and stuff for memorizing those, but you, it's best if you just kind of come up with your own way of how you're going to memorize uh, each of those definitions. Mm -hmm. And anytime that we have our like discussion boards, kind of like Patty, go ahead and practice that. So he's got a, an injury to his lateral like abdomen or his flank. So start defining those type of, of verbiage in your uh, description of injuries. Um, when you transport Patty, how are you going to transport him? Are you, is he going to be supine on a backboard? These are the type of things that we need labeled because in later down the line, you're going to learn about your med legal 
Patty's going to come back and say that you guys transported him on his face and that he almost suffocated. If you don't have it documented that he was supine on a backboard, there's no way it's your word against his. And uh, he might have bigger, better lawyers than you do. So knowing how to document how you're going to transport, uh, those kind of things will kind of save you later on. Uh, chapter six, um, there is, so if you go through, you should be able to see the links. I put a link for crash course on YouTube for each section of the body. So it divides it up. You should be able to, to access those. If you can't get the access to it, if you can't just click on the link, if you guys go on YouTube and you look up crash course, there's an animated like teaching how else would you describe this so this looks like online i don't know if you guys are familiar with crash course or if you're familiar with like khan academy they both do uh free education for students and adult learners and it covers all of the body systems so you can click on those it describes it it's got great animation they do a phenomenal job at kind of teaching you how to um, see the body, the anatomy and physiology. So I have links actually attached to the chapter readings. Um, it, can, it can be very intimidating at first, learning all of these different body parts, all these different functions. The anatomy itself can be very intimidating. There's a lot going on. And then the physiology on top of it. So how things are actually going to work and react together. Uh, the Crash Course and Khan Academy do a phenomenal job at kind of tying those two things in together. So the anatomy of what's going on and the physiology of how it all works. And knowing the difference between anatomy and physiology is going to help you guys in the future if you do choose to go into higher level of medicine. So feel free to, to click on those, adventure through the different YouTube Crash Course uh, episodes. Um, they should do every single body section. Uh, physiology, it's great for your patient assessment, especially when you start getting into shock and how patients are going to react and change with our treatment. Let's see. It will talk about the parasympathetic and sympathetic responses of the body. This is one of those words that you're going to have to memorize. You're going to have to know what the definition is, and you're going to have to know the difference between the sympathetic and the parasympathetic. If you think of it like the fight or flight, your sympathetic is your fight or flight response. So if you have, back in the day when we were being chased by mastodons and saber-toothed tigers, our body was created to absorb as much light as we can. So our eyes get really, the pupils get really big. The black part of the eyes get really big. We want as much light as we can see so we can run away from the dinosaurs and the monsters and whatnot. Our heart rate's gonna go up. Our breathing's gonna go up. We're gonna get faster, um, more responsive to things so we can get out of the situation that we're in. More blood's gonna be pumping faster so oxygen can get to the muscles and we can actually get away. That's gonna be your fight or flight response or your sympathetic response. So if you have a drug, recreational or otherwise, that affects the sympathetic, think of how it's going to affect. Think, think of how it's going to increase the, the pupils, the heart rate, the blood pressure. Um, sympathetic drugs would be like your cocaines, your speeds. It's gonna increase uh, those kind of functions. Your parasympathetic is more of your relax. That's the part of the body that wants to chill, that wants to, to sleep. We call it, we call that like the rest and digest. So you've got your fight and flight with your sympathetic and your rest and digest with your parasympathetic. So if you have a drug that affects the parasympathetic, it's going to start decreasing things. Um, when you, when you want to sleep, you don't want as much light. So your pupils are actually going to constrict. They're going to get smaller. You don't want to see nearly as much. 
your heart rate's gonna get a little lower, your breathing is gonna get lower, blood pressure, everything's gonna kind of slow down and relax. People that have too much narcotics, that is a parasympathetic response. They're gonna have teeny tiny little pupils, they're gonna have a slower heart rate, they're gonna have a slower respiratory rate. So you're parasympathetic. This is where you guys are gonna start learning. It's not just somebody overdosed on, on heroin. It's just a, a fact that we all know. Now you know why they die when they overdose on heroin, because it affects systems. This is, this is why we need to learn the anatomy as well as the physiology of things, of how our body is going to react. It also is going to, knowing the difference between your sympathetic and your parasympathetic is gonna make it understand why we have shock. When somebody goes into shock, you have a heart rate that starts to elevate, but the blood pressure stays the same. This is going to be your compensating shock. So the heart rate's gonna go up, it keeps the blood pressure the same, the body's gonna compensate. We want the brain to get fed with enough oxygenated blood, but we're losing some, so it's gotta increase that rate. We start to get decompensated when we can no longer keep that good blood pressure in the head and it starts to drop a little bit. Our heart rate's still gonna be elevated and high, but we're not able to keep that nice high blood pressure, so we start to decompensate. Once we're unable to do that, we go into our irreversible shocks where our body's no, no longer able to do that. It has to start, down, start slowing down the heart rate, the blood pressure starts to drop, and that's where people are gonna die of shock. So recognizing you have somebody that's been recently hurt, they have a good blood pressure, but their heart rate is elevated, they're responding in a compensating manner. So you have to recognize that if I give you a patient on a, on a practical that has a heart rate of 120, and their blood pressure is, is right there at like 120 over 80, you wanna treat them for shock because you should recognize, all right, their body is responding by elevating that heart rate and keeping that blood pressure normal. If I give you a second set of vitals and their heart rate is 120, but now their blood pressure is 100, what does that tell you? They're not able to keep that blood pressure up. So recognizing, all right, well, the heart rate's still up, but the blood pressure is starting to drop. They're no longer able to compensate. Let's see. That should be chapter seven that talks a lot about the homeostasis. Homeostasis is where we want our body to be. That's where everything is perfect. It's where we want our oxygen levels to be, our blood pressures to be, our heart rate, everything should be all nice, even level throughout the day. Um, and then chapter seven talks about the sympathetic and parasympathetic. It also covers the cardiopulmonary. So recognize all of the parts and pieces of the heart. And the heart's actually pretty, pretty neat thing in itself. It's got completely different muscle than the rest of the body. There, it's not the same as your, your skeletal muscle. It's not the same as your intestinal muscle. It has its own little power supply. It is a pretty phenomenal organ that we have and there's nothing else like it in the rest of the body. And it actually has its blood source on the outside just like the rest of our body, even though it has blood inside it. So like, it's hard to see, but like this, if I made this the heart, and I filled it with blood, it actually doesn't feed itself from the blood in there. It has arteries that are around it that actually feed it. So when we're talking about a heart attack, it's those vessels or those coronary arteries on the outside of the heart that actually get blocked. And when they're blocked, it kills the, the muscle tissue. So just because it's filled with blood doesn't mean that it's actually feeding itself from the blood that's inside those chambers. see get my notes from each chapter I also made a note on there about uh, the blood volume it doesn't take a whole lot of blood loss for different sized people um, like a soda can is as much blood as an infant might have and then a two liter bottle is as much blood as a adult 
female or adult male will have. I mean, depending on how big the person is. So if you see a large pool of blood, we need to react very quickly because there's not a whole lot of excess blood in certain size people. So depending on how much is around or how much is squirting, uh, recognizing that a smaller statured person is going to have a significant, like less blood than a, a larger person. And let's see. You guys have any questions, comments, or anything so far? Hopefully, I'm not going too fast either. Do you have any comments on those things, Ashley, while I find the, uh, the My Brady thing I'm going to pull up? Um, you just put me on the spot. I mean, there, there is quite a bit. Um, I mean, you explained it really well, but knowing the anatomy of the heart um, and the respiratory system and how those two systems work together, like those two if one's affected, the other one is going to be affected. And you can actually watch your patient um, show signs and symptoms like in their respiratory system. Um, and you already know like, okay, the respiratory system is speeding up. I know that that heart is being stressed out and I can expect these signs and symptoms. So really knowing your anatomy of the heart um, and just the body in general really, um, is really key is being a good EMT. And we don't have any questions in the chat box, so we must have explained it really well. Yeah. Um, I like to, uh, I, I basically consider all of my patients, everybody that I have dies from airway breathing circulation. Yeah. If it's not an airway problem, it's a breathing or circulation problem, which is going to be the respiratory or the cardiovascular. Whether it's going to be loss of blood so the circulation is gone or the heart fails from either a heart attack or some other issue that's going on with the heart is a circulation problem or it's a respiratory problem. So lungs filling up with fluid is kind of a cardiovascular as well as a respiratory problem where they stop breathing on their own or there's, it's not just a heart attack. I mean, there's, there's other like a stroke is kind of like a brain attack. It's the same kind of concept. Um, there's also uh, pulmonary embolism, which is kind of like a lung attack. So you can have all sorts of little blockages that kill muscle tissue. And if you have that, then you also have a respiratory problem where the, the tissue will actually die and it's no longer able to, to move uh, oxygenated blood. So they, they absolutely do play into each other and they will, they'll either increase together or decrease together like that, that uh, sympathetic, you're going to have your breathing increase. You want to breathe faster. You want to get more blood flowing. You want to get more oxygen. So your, your breathing is going to increase as well as your heart rate increasing that fight or flight. So recognizing, like she said, somebody starts to breathe a little faster. Um, if you guys ever watched, was it Terminator 2, when the one dude gets like shot full of holes and he's holding the bomb and he's breathing really, really quickly, that's in that shock. That is an irreversible shock at that point. He's breathing super quickly. He is completely blood out, blood out of his, um, his body. His respirations are incredibly fast, way faster than he would be able to maintain. And he ends up dying and then letting go of the button and everybody, everything explodes. But that is a good example of what a respiratory rate will look like when somebody starts to decompensate. Um, we have a question in the chat box. Bree, yeah. do you have a song for the heart as to how it flows? Say what? A song for the heart as to how it flows. Um, I do not have a song for the heart. Um, I have a song for pretty much everything, but there's a, there's all sorts of little like sayings, like, uh, I don't know. I can't think of any right now. I don't have a song for the heart. 
is on for anything, so I'm no help. Well, there's the, the toilet paper my ass was the tri tricupsid, pulmonary, mitral, and yeah. atrial. Those are your different valves that the blood goes through. Um, I always remember your, uh, your atrium and your ventricles. So AV, it's always in like AV, alphabetical. And then of course your left and right, which is the patient's left and the patient's right. Um, all veins return blood to the heart. All arteries leave the heart. There's two that do not fit the whole oxygenated, deoxygenated, and that's gonna be your, your pulmonary. So if blood is leaving the heart, it's an artery, but it's going to the lungs, it hasn't gotten oxygen yet. So it's still an artery, but it's just not oxygenated. And then as it leaves the lungs and goes back into the heart, so it can be ejected into the rest of the body, since it's going towards the heart, it's a vein, but this, this time it's actually got oxygen in it. So those are the only two that kind of don't fit the arteries have oxygenated blood type idea. But all of them will either, if they leave the heart, it's an artery. If they go towards the heart, uh, it's, it's a vein. Uh, your aorta is massive. It's like the size of your thumb. So if you think of a rupture in your aorta, um, you're going to bleed out super quick. It's, it's not going to take much time. You, you won't even be done with your 911 phone call before your, your toast. So recognizing your arteries this big, you've got femoral arteries that are that big. Um, when you have large vessels, we need to react really quickly. And you'll see more of that in your trauma with your tourniquet and bleeding and shock of why we have to react so quickly with tourniquets and with direct pressure. Uh, any other questions? So, no song. I, that must be someone that knows that I make up sorts, all sorts of songs for, for things. Uh, S. Russell. Yeah. Thanks, Steph. Yeah. I have a song for everything except apparently the heart. Like I said, I don't, I don't do well by reading. I have to either see it or make a, a video. Maybe that can get your credit from students, make up a song. Yeah, there you go. All right, so try to share. Uh, oh, and looks like uh, chapter eight is like uh, lifespan development. We have a lot of changes that happen throughout our body. Um, I noticed when I turned 30, I got heartburn for the first time and it was horrible. Um, a lot of other things are going to start happening now that I am getting older. Um, we, we start off uh, needing a lot more assistance. We can't live kind of on our own. We're dependent on other people. There's a lot more bones in infants than there are in adults bones will actually start to fuse together. So there are some changes there. All babies and kids have these like giant alien type heads too. They're like huge heads compared to the rest of their body, which means when they fall, they fall like lawn darts. Um, and when they have airway issues or when they're supine, they have such a big head that it kind of sticks out in the back and it creates this forward motion of the rest of their head. So if I was laying down and I had this big head, it would make me tilt forward, which will block off my airway. So one of the ways you can fix that is lifting up their, their back. So you put something behind their shoulders to create that space and it will make them more, more flat. Um, kids also have abnormally large tongues in relation to their, the rest of their mouth as well as a large epiglottis. So the epiglottis is what keeps us from um, putting food from our food hole into our air hole. So epiglottis covers up um, the trachea when you swallow, so you can actually have food go down in the esophagus and not get into the airway. They have a large one and it can easily become infected and inflamed. So you have this big flappy thing that's covering the trachea. 
It's supposed to block it from getting any food or water in there. But now it's swollen, and instead of being able to be lifted up and allow air in, it's so swollen that when it does move, it still covers the, the opening. Uh, it's very rare to have in adults because our epiglottis is about the same size as the tracheal opening, but in kids, it's a lot larger, and so it actually can hang over more. Think of it like a, uh, like a septic lid in the street, nice and round, and it covers it, ex and covers it perfectly. That's kind of like how ours is, but in the child, it's gonna be a lot larger. So that is one of the things that's going to be more common in kids in the medical. Um, I did see one, he was a 21 year old male that had epigl epiglottitis, which was pretty rare. We usually see this under like five or six years old, they'll get epiglottitis. Um, we actually saw a 21 year old that had it, which uh, they treated it just as if he was a, a kid, the same kind of medications to try to get it to stop. So if you think about what the epiglottis does, when I swallow, it will move and cover up the trachea. So every time I go to swallow, it moves. If it's sore, if it is inflamed, you're not gonna wanna swallow because you don't want it to cover the hole. So if you, right now, decide not to do any more swallowing, your mouth is gonna slowly start to fill up with a bunch of spit. You have nowhere else to put the spit, you're gonna lean forward and you're gonna let it drool out of your mouth because you really don't wanna swallow. We're gonna find kids leaning forward, drooling out of their mouth. This is a huge key that they've got an epiglottis problem. We don't even have to be in the same room. We can see them from the living room when we walk into the kitchen. You see these kids leaning forward and they're drooling, you know that there's gonna be an airway problem. Um, what else? Uh, kids, babies are um, obligate nose breathers. This is something that we develop as we get a little older. I know it sounds funny, but um, if you have a dog and you plug the dog's nose, it will stop breathing. It's, I don't know, it's something I do with my dogs apparently. I don't know if other people do it. But you plug the dog's nose and it doesn't have the like mentation to open its mouth and breathe through its mouth. Little kids are the same way. And that's because they will body, bottle feed. They put a bottle in their mouth and they can continually feed on that bottle and breathe through their nose. So if you have a, a, an infant that has a bunch of snot or clogged um, nair, it's not gonna get that air in. So recognizing that little kids might not have the mental capacity or the development to be able to breathe through their mouth if their sinuses get plugged. So that's another kind of lifespan development thing that you're gonna have to know is nasal airways need to be more open and cared for in your babies than they do in your adults. I'm trying to think anything else that's really specific that I wish that I knew more of when I was an EMT1 student. Uh, babies, like brand new babies, their only way to communicate is by crying. And so it's not necessarily a bad thing that they're crying. I mean, it is a sign um, that something is wrong, but that's how they communicate with um, adults. And so for us, we like a baby crying because that means they're moving air. And we want to encourage that. Um, so that was just something before I had kids. Um, you know, I'm the youngest of my family. I never babysat. And so it was a big eye opener when I had a kid that, you know, crime's a good thing. That's how he's talking to me. Um, and it really helped when I was assessing babies, just really knowing, um, you know, little things like they, they can't talk to us. So paying attention to the cry, paying attention how they're interacting with mom or dad or their caregiver will really help you. Like if they're trying to get away from mom, that's a big giveaway that something is seriously wrong. If they're trying to get away from, you know, their normal caregiver, it, you know, it's a big deal. If they're trying to get away from me, that's to be expected, right? Because I'm a brand new person. I'm a stranger to them. Um, so you got to pay attention to those little things. Like what are their eyes doing? 
Um, are they making good eye contact with you and then um, when you walk in the room, are they paying attention to their little toy that you're waving in their face? They're limp. It's a big deal. Um, so we got to pay attention to those little things. Not everybody has kids. So like it was a big eye opener for me, just paying attention to those little things you can tell. Like if a kid is super sick or just a little fussy, like they fell down and mom freaked out. When you guys cover your uh, GCS, with GCS with adults, it's a lot easier because we can talk and we can follow commands. When you cover GCS for kids and peds, one of the things on there is whether the, the child is consolable. So like she said, crying is normal. And most parents can get their kids to, to kind of calm down, um, except for like tantrums, of course. But if the kids hurt and crying, parent can usually pick them up and can get them to at least start to calm down or kind of slow their, their crying, where they're just kind of more sniffly. If they are inconsolable, that is more indicative that there is something wrong. The child can't tell you that there's something wrong um, besides just the crying, but if there is no way to console them or calm them, then there's still continuing to be pain or other issues that are happening. So recognizing what is a normal cry and what is a, an abnormal, inconsolable cry will really tell you that the child is still hurt or still sick. Um, as, we, as we get significantly older, as we get older, um, we start getting more medical issues that require more medications. Um, make sure you get a medication list for your patients. Um, as we get older, we might have a medication for a heart problem, and then we take a medication for the symptoms from that other medication, and then another medication, and we just keep compiling on these different meds that we're taking, and then we start getting comorbidities, which is multiple diseases on top of each other. So we'll find somebody with, uh, they're obese, they've got a heart problem, and they have diabetes. So we're gonna start seeing multiple compounding factors as we age, as we get older. Um, there's also loss, loss of, of sight, loss of hearing, loss of sensation. With both ends of the spectrum, so your peds and your geriatrics, we don't have the ability to stay warm, whether it's we don't have the ability to put clothes on or we don't have the ability to remove clothes because a child can't dress themselves and a, uh, an elderly person may not be able to dress themselves or they get too hot and they can't take the, the extra blankets off or the extra clothes off and they lose the ability to actually create that heat. Um, children might not be able to shiver or generate heat like we do as, as um, younger adults, but as they get into the geriatrics, they also lose the ability to create heat or generate heat or even to sweat. So being aware of what kind of temperature we're in, if I'm outside and I've got somebody that's sick, I want to put them in the back of my ambulance or I want to get them out of the sunlight or get them out of the wind and the cold early so I don't have to um, worry about that as something that'll make them sicker or worse. So as like somebody my age, um, I can be outside for quite, a, quite some time, but a child or an adult, I wanna make sure that the environment does not become a factor in their care. I can get them out of that kind of environment where I can control it. Also with elderly, they don't have the fat or the muscle tissue as much. Um, so I wouldn't want to put them on a hard backboard or on a hard chair, anything that's going to be hard because even though that they may be overweight, they may be out of shape, anything like that, they're not going to have the thickness of fat. It's mostly going to just kind of reside in specific areas of their guts or, uh, but over the bony promise, promises, there's not going to be as much fat layer and they're not going to have the muscle. The muscle is actually what's going to be protecting the bone 
um, from, from damage. So you have somebody that's really bony and they are on a hard surface, it could actually do a lot more damage. So think of that when you have your elderly patients, putting them on some sort of cushion, adding extra cushion to things. If they are complaining uh, of pain, making sure that you look and inspect that area uh, because their skin might not be as, as strong. It actually be can become a lot more brittle and tear. Um, like my skin doesn't tear, your skin probably doesn't tear very easily. But when you get uh, into the geriatric ages, it, it can actually tear and rip instead of uh, just kind of getting an abrasion or, or like a scrape. Um, then you've got your spinal. So gravity is weighing on us all the time. And as we age, gravity kind of starts to take its toll and the cushion that's in between our spine will eventually start to get squished more and more. We can actually lose our height as well as having a curvature of the spine. Constantly looking down, our spine starts to, to curve. Um, it can curve different directions. It can sway into our, our lumbar, which is going to create more of a curvature in like that region. Um, if I have a significant curvature of my spine, laying me down on a backboard is going to be incredibly painful and could do more damage. So you may have to put additional padding to kind of fill in those gaps. If my spine is not just a slight S, but it's a significant S shape, you may need to put a, a large pillow underneath to fill in that gap so that my flat is now the new flat. Um, never force anybody into the position that you, like the board, because we don't all fit that mold. We need to make sure that we keep them into their new, that's their new norm. There, that's their spine and that's how it will normally be from here on out. Um, when you guys go and go to the store or anything else and you start seeing more people, look at people's shapes of their spine. Look at the difference between um, little kids and elderly and see kind of how they're leaned over. Sometimes they are leaned over so much that when they have to look up at you, they have to like tilt their head back really far to look up because the rest of the time, if they were going to look anatomically, they're actually like looking down at the ground and that's kind of their new normal. So if we have to adjust how we're standing, if we have to kneel down on the floor in front of them to make it easier for them, these are the type of things that we're going to have to do. Um, any notes on geriatrics here, Ashley? All right. I will share my screen to make sure everybody can see. I, I just had a quick question. Yeah. Um, so you said on the uh, the the spine it um, scrunches kind of. Will chiropractic be able to fix that, or is that not fixable? Um, it's it's something that's more chronic. Um, okay. With, I mean, it also depends on who you talk to. There's, I, I see a chiropractor often. I really like my chiropractor. There's a lot of people that don't support chiropractors. Um, it's just, that's something that you're going to have to do personally, your own research. Um, but as like, answer. huh? That was a good political answer. Yes. Um, having support for your spine doing exercises and stretching it for any part of your, your body is going to be the best thing. So having good, strong muscles to support against gravity, like being able to, to keep that, that space and then doing a lot of um, flexibility and stretching exercises. So honestly, like just being more in shape, which I'm, I need to do. Um, <laughs> Uh, yoga, stretching, anything like that would actually be very beneficial on people's spines because um, it, it kind of stretches things out. But Thank you. The, most of those, it's just, it's just chronic over time. We have so much weighing down on us all the time. And then if you start adding weight into it, um, people that are, are obese are going to have different weights in areas that our body's not meant to carry weight. And so it's going to put even additional strain, um, especially if you 
you spend all your day like sitting, it's going to change the shape of your spine as if you were standing. Uh, so just having, having a way to kind of counter what you've been doing on your body all day long. So if you're sitting all day long, you have to spend the rest of the time stretching it out or laying supine or standing to kind of counteract what you were doing the rest of the day. Uh, that would be the best answer for that, I guess. Thank you. Yeah. I've got one more question as well. Um, when dealing with, um, I can't remember the actual medical term for it is, but uh, your hunchback patients, if you have to board them or something of that nature, how would you handle something like that? Um, so that would be a lot of like cushion behind. So they've got that, that kind of hunchback. Um, it's hard to like make it without like a diagram of anything. Um, putting a large padding behind their head to make it, to where to, whatever shape they're in. Um, and if, if you have a vacuum splint, that's gonna be the best. They actually have um, where it sucks all of the air out and it becomes kind of a hard transport. But when, it, when you don't suck all the air out, it's actually like flat and you can fold and bend and manipulate it to take up all the gap and then you suck all the air out and it becomes like rock hard. Um, but if you're going to have to backboard them because you don't have a vacuum board, then you're going to have to use blankets, pillows, or anything else to kind of stuff in those, those areas. Um, so if they have lordosis or kyphosis, those are the two different um, common curvatures in the elderly or geriatric patients. So if you have to put it underneath the lumbar, if you have to put it behind the, behind the head, um, and you should do that behind the knees anyways, because I don't know if you've ever laid down on like a couch with your feet up on the chair. And if you ever fall asleep, your knees are going to fall asleep and be painful. So you always, you don't want them like super straight. You don't want your knees to be straight. You want to put something underneath them to give them a little bit of a bend. So putting blanket or some sort of padding underneath the knees is actually preferred on backboards anyways. So padding any area that, isn't completely flat. Nobody's body shape is as flat as a, a backboard. There's always going to be gaps and holes and filling that with, um, I have done a blood pressure cuff and put a, a non-filled blood pressure cuff underneath a person's lumbar and then they were able to squeeze it up until they got relief. So that's another thing that you can do. You can put a blood pressure cuff under areas and they say, and you just tell them, all right, just pump it up until you get some relief. If it's too much, all you got to do is let some air out and then they can pump it up again. So that is another option. If you have extra blood pressure cuffs, if you don't have enough to do that, that's not going to be a, a viable option for you. So that's your question. Yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Hey, Bree. Yeah. So, um, can I add on your kid discussion? Yeah. Um, since I've actually like worked in a pediatric office, I think what's helpful too is if you're running an ambulance, it's very scary to have kids as patients. Um, one thing we always rush in to adults, but with children, you have to kind of take it slow. And I think w with that, because you're running right to them and they'll be scared and, um, so just remember, I guess, just to take it easy. And sometimes you have to like just talk and um, soothe so that they actually will trust you a little before you like, shove the whole stethoscope in their face and on their chest. And um, But those are just helpful hints anyway. Yes, definitely remain like calm. Um, if a child trips and falls and the parents go, oh my gosh, and they kind of freak out, the child is in pain and will freak out. If the child trips and falls and the parents are like, you're fine, and kind of move on, the child I've seen often is like, oh, well, I guess it's not that bad. Um, so making sure when you do enter, you have that calm presence you're less likely to increase their anxiety. They're also, they're, they're gonna not like you to begin with. You got big blue or purple scary hands, you're a stranger, 
you're coming into their home you've got all these weird gadgets and and scary things and many of them associate medical people with shots and painful things kids don't go to the doctor unless they're sick or they get shots and so for their experience with medical people they don't really want us to be around to begin with um, so and then the parents huh? are shoving their child at you <laughs> yes, yes. Um, so and you can definitely see them from a distance like i was saying you can see a kid leaned over and drooling from across the room if you get um, a pucker factor where you kind of get tense up when you see a child um, go with that gut if you see a, a, a kid and you look at them and you're like oh my god that kid looks super sick go with that gut um, and you can see that like from across the room you'll start assessing them from there as you walk closer you just start from the feet work your way up towards the head um, what's different about our head to toe assessment with adults versus peds is let's say you have a broken arm i'm going to talk to you i'm going to make sure your airway breathing circulation is good and then i'm going to go to your broken arm and i'm going to evaluate it with little kids you want to evaluate everything and then touch the ouchy place last um, it's going to be once you touch it they're not going to like you and they're not going to trust you after that um, so if their stomach hurts you're going to do their head to toe skipping their stomach um, go all the way down to the feet, do everything else, and then assess their stomach. Um, you also don't want to lie to kids. Don't, don't lie to any of your, your patients. Like, this is not going to hurt, those type things. Um, it is going to hurt. And if it is going to hurt, they need to know. With an adult, you can pretty much tell them it's going to hurt and get your stuff ready and then get it done. With a kid, you're going to tell them, but you're going to tell them right before you do it. So if you are going to do something that's going to be painful, get everything set up, everything ready to go. Tell them, all right, this is going to pinch or this is going to hurt and then do it. Um, don't give them time to think about it and react. Um, that way you're not lying, but you kind of get it done and over with. Use the parents. The parents know how to like kind of hold their kid. They're there to comfort their kid. They can hold toys for their kid to kind of distract them. And they're going to be a useful tool for all of your information. Parents know what the kids um, normally like eat, drink, what they weigh, when their last diaper was, um, those type, type history questions that the child won't be able to tell you. You'll be able to get from the parent. So a lot of your um, your assessment is going to actually come from the parent or caregiver and not from the patient. All right. Thanks, Steph, for kind of jumping in there with more stuff. Anyone else? No. All right. So, huh? I think it's important too to distinguish, you know, we're talking about little kids. If you go to a 12 year old, let's say, and you start asking mom and dad all these questions, they're going to kind of look at you and kind of funny. Um, I know my 13 year old, like if, if I start talking to my 13 year old, like, hey, when did you go to the bathroom last? When did you do this? He's, he's going to like shut down. <laughs> <laughs> Something I've noticed too, even though I am the paramedic and the lead medic, if I've got a teenage boy and I got a teenage crew member, or not a teenage crew member, a young, you're all youngins to me, um, but like a 20 year old medic, that 20 year old medic is going to interact with my teenage boy a lot better than if, you know, some 40 year old mom starts talking to him. So you guys just got to kind of feel out your patience too. Um, the older the kid gets, the more independence they have and a little bit more knowledge and it actually builds their trust up too. Like if you start asking them questions, it will help them build confidence in you and build trust and they're more willing to open up and tell you or um, you know what happened or they'll be a little bit more cooperative um, with your assessment, like they'll, they're not going to pull away from you when you put the blood pressure cuff on. All 
All right. So you guys can see my screen, I hope. Um, one of the, should be on here. So the syllabus, the Emerge syllabus, it has on there what days the class is for like the, like the schedule. The syllabus is to be used for future classes. So it has day, but it doesn't have date. So it is a 21 day course um, spread over 28 days. So the syllabus will have chapters one through four on day one and then the exam on day two. Um, that does not mean that on day three is the next set of chapters that's due because on the calendar, the actual like date, um, Sundays, you guys didn't have anything due. So when you're looking for your Zoom schedule, make sure that you use the calendar. The syllabus is just to give you an idea of how fast the course is. It just doesn't take into account calendar days. So there are days that you guys have off where you don't have any assignments due and there's no Zoom meetings. So make sure you use the Emerge calendar. Um, you can find it if you go to, so if you're at your main menu, go to Course Home, Communication Tools. It's a document that we've shared and it's right at the beginning. So it's right there. Um, looks like the rest of you guys have found your PowerPoints. Um, you guys have been looking over some of those. Um, your miscellaneous handouts for anything else that you might um, need. And then your Zoom meetings. Um, I can, so far, I can only get the audios to um, get attached. And that's because the videos are massive and it does not allow me to put anything that size um, uploaded. I even compressed it in a zip file and it won't let me. So it's audio only. Um, I'll try to, I'll try to keep working on it, especially after this meeting here. Uh, your discussion boards, make sure you guys get those done. Um, so far it's just the med legal and patties that you have to get done uh, for the first module. The other ones are kind of later um, or chapter specific. Um, so document sharing, make sure you guys use your calendar. It's basically we have a Zoom meeting the same day as your exam. And it's so we can cover information like we just did to help you understand what some of your questions, what they're, what they're kind of looking for. Um, these questions are not, they're test bank and they're national registry type questions. Um, there was one that was brought up that was, um, how was it? Oh, it said there was, which thing causes an airway obstruction? And it, it mentioned infection, like facial trauma, tongue, and something else. And most people think that the tongue is the airway obstruction. Yes, the tongue absolutely is an airway obstruction. But what causes an airway obstruction? What causes the tongue to get in the way? Because right now my tongue is not in the way. But if I had an infection and it caused my tongue to swell, or it made me go unconscious, that would make my tongue go in the way. Or if I had facial trauma, and I bit my tongue or I had facial trauma and, and blood, that would cause an airway obstruction. So that's how these questions are going to be asked. You're gonna start seeing more and more that are, they're, they're not trying to trick you, but you have to read into what it wants you to read. It wanted you to read what causes an airway problem instead of what is the most common airway obstruction. Does that make any sense? Does everybody understand? It's, it's a stupid question, I don't like it, but when you think of it like that, it kind of makes more sense of what it was asking. And I hope I can clarify some of the questions like that. Um, it was brought up uh, by more than one person, that question, so if you did get that one wrong, that's what it was talking about. It wasn't the tongue, it was the fact of what causes the tongue to get in the way. 
Um, any questions? We've covered chapters five through eight. Know your anatomy. Understand the difference between anatomy and physiology. Um, start recognizing patterns between the cardiovascular and the respiratory and how they relate to each other when it comes to medical and when it comes to trauma. Um, understand that there are differences. Pediatrics are not just little tiny adults. They are their own little creatures that have different sized airways and multiple bones that we don't have. Um, it's pretty much all I have for you guys. So if you guys have any questions, this is a perfect opportunity. Otherwise, um, pretty much done for the evening. Thank you, Brie. Have a nice day. How is everybody doing with their reading assignments and stuff in general? How is everybody doing? Well, it's a lot for people who actually are full-time workers but um you make do <laughs> just just being honest yeah no i appreciate that and this is giving us good feedback for the next class mm -hmm. yeah what was everybody's so, favorite chapter so far how about the hardest chapter <laughs> physiology and anatomy <laughs> Yeah, well, that you guys have a lot of uh, extra resources. Definitely use YouTube because Crash Course, I had never even heard of it until Mandy and Ashley talked about it. It's awesome. I wish I knew more, like, I wish I knew it earlier. That's true. I have to say, though, um, I like, this is just since I'm going through this again, I like the fact that we have the Zoom meetings to where you can elaborate on certain things. Um, I think this benefits everybody who are new to this um, and for people like me who actually has been in, in the system but need to have a refresher. So I appreciate If you guys want Bree to go over specific things, maybe send her a quick email because I know she prepares her presentations before this Zoom meeting. So. Maybe if you want her to elaborate on a specific subject, send her a quick email saying that's what you want to cover. If you're okay with that, Brie. Yeah, I, I, whenever I do get emails from you guys, I kind of take note of it so I can bring it up at these Zoom meetings. Because um, I figure if one person has an issue, it's probably, there's 40 of you guys. So if one person has the issue, I imagine that the other 39, 42, 43 other people that you guys have um, will have very similar um, issues. So just uh, just let me know or let them know. And we work together as a team, the, the three of us. So we, we try to get this all worked out. Um, so if you guys are having any issues or any extra questions, or if, you, if you're not getting a topic and you want more, just let us know and we'll put it into the Zoom meeting. And I really appreciate you guys uh, getting back real quick. I had a question the other day and my question was answered within like an hour and a half. It was amazing. So thank you. We try. <laughs> and I am gonna be hey. scheduling um, uh, Zoom meetings for you guys if you want them um, to touch base um, here shortly. Hey, and Brie, if you are so inclined to share some of your um, tips and how you like your songs or your little um, favorite jargon, I think that's actually like really, really good because I like how you do your things. I think it's, it's neat for us listeners or learners who are not so much um, book learners, but more of a hands-on and songs are just great. So that's probably why I asked you about the heart thing but yeah anyway um I am um, I'm slowly putting my stuff on YouTube because I've been asked so many times so it's it's getting there it's getting there awesome <laughs> anybody else I have a quick question real quick on uh, proximal and distal 
So I got one of the questions that I got wrong was uh, regarding the nose and the mouth, and specifically, is the mouth uh, proximal to the nose? And I said yes, because the mouth is closer to the torso than the nose, but apparently, proximal and distal does not work for everything. No. Specifically, the nose and the mouth. I'm wondering what the, is the what is the line that determines prox proximal and distal are more specific <laughs> for limbs. Okay. Um, and that's because when my arms are down, what's going to be distal is going to be my my hand, and proximal is going to be up here. But when I lift my arm up, it's still going to be the same. That's not the, the case when it comes to superior and inferior. My core body is always going to be superior, inferior, lateral, medial, midline. Your limbs, because people are going to be more confused on where it is. Um, so if I say like inferior to my, my wrist, so people are going to think inferior here, but if my hand's up, people are going to be confused and think this is superior. Okay. So always use your proximal and distal when it comes to your legs, your arms, uh, because then you can say, if I have an injury that <coughs> is uh, distal of the elbow, you know that it's going to be from the elbow and down. If it's proximal, it's going to be closer to the elbow. Um, when we have distal, you need to check distal pulses. So I have a break in my, my humerus. Um, you check distal pulses. That means any any pulse from here down so if you have to okay. check it here you can check it like here that's still going to be distal so gotcha. that's that's why so the the nose being um superior to the mouth um that's that's what it was going for even though it is like confusing on that that's why they separated it because people can lift their arms up and then they're going to get confused on what's inferior and uh, superior okay so then in the future i'll be safe just knowing that proximal and distal is only for legs and arms i yeah i only use it for the legs and arms okay cool thank you mm -hmm. Any other questions? I don't see any in the okay, chat. That's it. All right, guys. Uh, good luck on exam number two. Um, let me know how things go if you guys have any specific um, issues or concerns with anything. And uh, I will see you all next meeting. if you don't mind staying on for a second. Yeah, of course. Thanks. Have a good night.